Hi, everyone. It's Joe Venary, the host of Fit Insider, the show where I talk with the entrepreneurs, executives, and investors who are redefining the business of fitness and wellness. Today, I'm joined by Ed Buckley. Ed is the chairman and CEO of PeerFit. In today's episode, I talked with Ed about pioneering the concept of fully funded fitness, building the billion-dollar bridge between fitness and healthcare, and the significance of the name PeerFit. I had a great time chatting with Ed, and I hope you enjoy listening. Let's get into it. Hey, Ed. Welcome to Fit Insider. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. Definitely. I'm excited to chat. Um, and really, just to kick things off and give some folks the context around what we're going to be talking about, can you tell everybody more about PeerFit, where you guys are, uh, how the company got started, and, and what you're working on? Absolutely. So for us at PeerFit, the way that we view you know, this whole space, right, which is both corporate wellness and flexible fitness, and really in the last year, they've you know, kind of merged together as more people have gotten into the spaces. Look, we saw the individual person uh, struggling uh, to get over all the barriers to become fit, right? Multiple gyms, multiple studios, uh, subsidy dollars that were difficult to use or had a lot of restrictions. And we just said, you know, how can we clear the table for people? How can we redefine wellness, take it from a complicated eye roll moment and make it simple? And the, the premise was this, figure out what people are already doing and make it really simple. Or what people were doing is they like hopping around between the best fitness experiences and they want their money to travel with them and they want to do it with their friends, family, and coworkers. So we went to employers and health plans and made it ridiculously simple for them to be able to fund people to hop around to all of these great fitness experiences. And you know, we started in Florida with some employers, then went regionally, then went nationally. And now we're actually baked in the plan benefit for um, health plans. So it's no longer just that local HR person at the, you know, an employer trying to, to go to their CFO and get dollars. It's part of the plan benefit that, you know, I'll just use myself. Uh, I, as an employee at PeerFit, have Aetna. And Aetna pays for myself and our staff to go do fitness experiences. I'm in New York City this morning at a conference. And me and Todd, our chief growth officer, woke up and walked in the cold at 5.30 in the morning to go to a studio paid for by your insurance company. And you know the, the last piece of that is our name, right? PeerFit. We, we don't want to just send you to a gym or studio. We want to send you and your friends, family, and coworkers to do it together. We know that that's, you know, the winning formula is that peer-to-peer engagement. So, you know, what started a couple of years ago in grad school as I was a fitness instructor at the University of Florida has now grown to a nationwide company. Hundreds of thousands of lives have PeerFit fully paid for by their health plan, by their employers. And I think that's one of the, the novel things that we've been able to do really well is we're all about fully funded fitness. Other groups that have gotten in the space are on flexible and temporary and, and cost sharing. Uh, we've seen the most success by building a very valuable and transparent platform so that the health plans and employers want to embrace stepping up and fully funding fitness. Yeah, that's amazing. I think it's obviously incredibly smart and really beneficial both when you look at both sides of that value proposition, right? People are you know, getting paid to work out, which is great. And the insurance companies um, are helping facilitate, you know, healthier lives and healthier individuals, which in the long run is more beneficial to them. So it all checks out when you think about, you know, the value proposition. One thing that you kind of mentioned there there was, um, you know, the number of people and kind of different attempts at doing this in this space, whether you, you think of it at corporate wellness or, you know, your kind of terminology, fully funded fitness, which I think is great. How does PeerFit, like kind of digging into the the details, different from other companies in the space? Um, you know, your model, you said going direct to the insurance companies, uh, that can be notoriously difficult to to kind of negotiate those deals and get an in there. Um, so both, I, I guess it's kind of a, a two-part question. How specifically is PeerFit doing it differently? And then what is it like and how are you able to kind of get that traction with an insurance company to prove this out? Man, that's <laughs> the, the the book will be out sometime in the future, and you can read about our our journey to get here. No, um, it, it's interesting. So this conference I'm at today was talking about this very topic, which is 
health plans have to be risk averse by nature, right? They have to be risk averse for safety reasons. Tech companies and disruptive companies seek to do literally the opposite. And you could be a very successful consumer facing, uh, disruptive, exponentially growing company. And what ends up happening is they go to health plans and say, well, do I really have to be HIPAA compliant, SOC 2 compliant, WCAG compliant, you know, all of these things? Well, I just want to be able to use the data a completely different way and, and be transparent and, and, and share data to do all of these things that drives their, you know, business model. And health plans don't move on that. You're not going to make them redraw the line in the sand. And so we knew that we had to build a team that understood both sides of this bridge we were building, right? One side is healthcare, one side is fitness, gyms, studios, streaming. They each have their own needs and wants, except didn't understand the other sides. So we had to build a team that could talk across this bridge, right? We call it the billion dollar bridge we're building. Um, and, and, once again, I think it's easy to assume you can just jump over. Hey, I know fitness. I'm direct to consumer. I bet I'll just understand the world of employers and health plans. And a lot of people have failed at it, right? There's a lot of bodies along the road. There's been a lot of money wasted by people taking it lightly. And our team, we brought in just amazing people who have worked at health plans, who have sold technology companies to health plans, who have sold you know, digital health companies to health plans. So we know that space. Uh, and we brought in great people who are experts in the fitness industry. And we made both sides learn the other side. So I'll use um, Chris Patton as a perfect example. He runs all of our partnerships with our fitness partners, right? And he's worked on the fitness side. But when he started at PeerFit, he was in our meeting selling to employers and health plans. So he intimately knows, right, as much of our team does, kind of, this skill set on both sides. And, and we've been doing this for years. You know, that's the one thing is you can't jump into employers and health plans with success. It takes years and years and years, and there's no getting around it. There really is no getting around it. It takes years to get through that. And that's a hundred percent what we do. So I, I think the reason other people have struggled and we've done so well is, you know, know thyself. This is what we do. This is all of what we do. Um, and that's why I think we're able to focus our attentions to be as efficient and effective as possible. And we knew from day one that we couldn't go to a health plan and said, Hey, we're a young startup. You should totally just listen to us. We had to go direct to employer just to get data, just to get validation. And just for our own sake, get some input so that we could tweak and iterate that product. So it was a perfect product market fit by the time we actually had the attention of the health plans. Yeah, I think it makes a ton of sense. And, you know, in hindsight, the way that you describe it, it's it's almost obvious that you need to build this, you know, two-pronged attack that people who understand and have worked in healthcare and with healthcare providers and also people that understand fitness. But I think, you know, oftentimes from the outside looking in, uh, especially for when you use the disruptive or innovative startup um, kind of example, it's like, you know, n no, we're just going to steamroll everything. And we're there's no barrier that we can't get through. There's no hurdle that we can't, you know, overcome. You know, it's not really the case when you get down to talking about healthcare and employers and then convincing people, um, you know, that they need to not only work out, but that it's going to be a, now a part of that whole ecosystem. Um, so it's amazing just to see the inner workings of that and how you thought through it was well and go ahead yeah i was just gonna say yeah yeah the point you just brought up and and so in lies the third leg of our stakeholder pillar right which is we serve health plans and employers we serve our fitness partners and to try to be a, a a supporter a lobbyist almost you know for them to get more healthcare dollars but then at the end of the day even if we get contracts with our fitness partners and even if we get health plan contracts well now you actually have to make it work by having people sign up and want to use it and want to come back because if all we did was sign up people who already have gym memberships and are already he uh, you know healthy, basically making the fit people more fit, then we have no value prop long term to the health partners. So it is how do you understand individual user engagement and do it so with the the segment of the population that doesn't typically love fitness. They will you know engage in physical activity, but maybe they don't love it. So how do you activate those people? 
And that's really been the other aspect of the business that, you know, you have to be great at all three phases and, and not just great at one or two. Right. And when you start to think about that and, and kind of digging a little deeper, when you talk about corporate wellness, traditionally, it's it's basically the idea that, you know, there's the uh, how to quit smoking or relieve back pain or different programs and workshops, lunch and learns that people would come in and have. And certainly the idea of providing an incentive to people to exercise, whether that's paying for a gym membership or incentivizing them for going to the gym, isn't necessarily yeah. new. Um, no. but, but it's that piece that you talked about where it's where we understand what people want to do. We want to give them the the types of studio experiences, the opportunities to engage and also get their friends to go. How did you and how are you approaching that piece with we need to get people to exercise? We need to get them to go to the gym. How do you get the, the word out about that, uh, incentivize them and, and keep them coming back? Yeah, I mean, some extent of that is our secret sauce. And, you know, there's already enough people looking over our shoulder and copying every move that we do. So I'll, I'll be as blunt as I can while sure. still regarding some of our strategy. You know, I, I look at this and say, you know, the name of our company is PeerFit, right? It's ingrained in our ethos that it is about you and your peers engaging. You know, we're not named after the ability to go to classes or gyms or, you know, whatever. It is about you and your peers. That is at our core who and what we're about. And so, you know, we just saw one of our own stats today that was amazing to kind of prove this point. So we were looking at employers that have very few peer fit users versus ones that have, you know, more, right? A lot, a lot more peer fit users concentrated in one employer. And when there's more people using it, the usage, like how many classes they're going to per person significantly increases. And so I would go back just like it's probably obvious, but the data bears it out. You will exercise more if people around you are exercising. It's just that simple. And if it's all free for you and you've got this kind of frictionless freedom and it's fully funded, all the Fs that you can say on, you know, live air, right. um, then then you're going to end up using more credits. And the other thing that we found with them was the ones that had more peer fitters were more stable with their activity. So not only were they going more often, but they were they were more stable. They didn't have these spikes of going a bunch, then not going, then going a few times. So you know that's how we see approaching this population is uh, almost it's a snowball enrollment. How do you take those early adopters where most people get those and then stop? How do you take those and make it so simple and almost rewarding to get the people next to them in the cubicle to go? That that's that's really the the onus that's on us. I'll I'll give you a, a, a stat here. Okay, so this year alone, we increased the number of credits people using per person per month sixty one percent from the beginning of the year to this to this point because all we've been doing is focusing on engagement, 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 and that's what matters. And when they, when somebody goes, uh, assuming the employer and their health plan, you know, offers the peer fit benefit, what does it look like from the consumer side? Can I just go and look at the listing of the gyms and kind of pick and choose? And you talk a little bit about the credits. So like, how does that user experience piece work? Yeah. And I want to address this credit system, right? Because we were the first to pioneer this system. And once again, I know it's been copied since then, but we always knew that this was a great way to have stable unit economics, to have a, a business model that made sense and didn't lose money and, and have terrible, you know, just downside where, where you had to change it, right? So we always knew we wanted to do this. And the idea was, think about an arcade, right? You can walk in, exchange your money for a pocket full of tokens, and some games are one token, some are two, some are three, and you get to choose how to use them. That's what we wanted to do was empower the user to say, hey, we're going to give you a certain amount of spend you can spend every month. And maybe it's going to a bunch of studios. Maybe it's doing just one or two really expensive personal training, small group training sessions, or maybe it's a membership to a gym and you've got a couple of credits left over to do studios. Um, so what happens is you go on your PeerFit app or you can log on on your computer if you want to. And, and the first time you get on, you know, you fill out your account information. It knows, it looks at your eligibility file and tells you, oh, Ed, you're a member of this health plan or this employer. We're going to give you X number of credits a month because every employer and health plan choose different amounts. And yeah, I'm just scrolling through. Hey, what's near me? Okay, you know, I'm in New York. Mile High Run Club is a couple blocks away. There's a class at, you know, 5 p.m., 6 p.m., and 7 p.m. 
And out of my 50 credits I have, it's going to cost me you know, seven credits. Do you want to go? Yes. And then comes the most important part, right? After you reserve that spot in the class, it always says, who do you want to bring with you, right? Who do you want to bring with you? That's that peer and peer fit. Every time someone says they're going to go somewhere, we are constantly asking them, so who, who do you want to go with you? What happens when, you know, in some cases, surely they're inviting somebody who maybe doesn't work at that company or the same benefits aren't offered? Are you guys, you know, onboarding them in some way to, to incentivize them to come? Absolutely. Like I said, it's all about your friends, family, and coworkers. So your coworkers obviously have peer fit if you have it too. But what about your friends and your family? Maybe, you know, you and I are friends and, and you work down the street at a different employer and you have peer fit. Great. I, I can invite you just as easily, right? The, the whole system talks to each, itself. But if I invite someone who doesn't have peer fit, it's just as simple. They, they get the invite. They can immediately buy credits themselves and, and, and you know, come and join. Now, I will say we are not a direct-to-consumer business by any means, right? We're not here advocating to go get uh, individual users. We call them plus ones. If an individual who, who comes into our system and isn't covered by their plan or their employer, it's because they got brought in by someone who does. And so, you know, I think that's an important distinction is while we have the capability for consumers to buy, it's not our distribution system. It's because we just want to help accommodate and make it really easy for our members to go. And as we know, if their friends, family, and coworkers can go with them, they're more apt to stay. They're out to, to, to go more often. Uh, there's a great academic study that shows, you know, what's the number one reason why men go to the gym? And it's because their wife starts working out. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they start working out. And then it was, what's the number one reason why women go to the gym? Because they want to work out with other women, right? So every decision about going is about other people. And frankly, clearly, if you want to control the entire population's physical activity, get women working out and they'll get everyone else to work out. Yeah, I think that was an interesting point that you made there, just talking about the ability to do the plus ones, but that isn't necessarily the distribution channel or approach. With that being said, do you think of it as a competition between going the route that you are through insurance companies and employers and a direct-to-consumer route? Or do you see that the market is being so big that really it's it's two different types of people that you're approaching and there's two different ways to do that? I mean, it's such a fascinating question. I, I would say it's a bit of a yes and a no answer, mm -hmm. which is in the beginning, times were simple. They were the direct-to-consumer plays, and then there was our play, right? And to be frank, we didn't care about them at all because what does it matter, right? They're spreading the gospel of flexible fitness, and that's a great thing for us. Now, as their model clearly has consolidated or eroded, you know, we see the direct to consumer ones coming into our space or trying to come into our space, but you don't see us coming after that space. So I think that just shows you where the stability is at. And I, once again, well, look, we don't really care what other people are doing. We like what we're doing. And what matters is that we feel great about our strategy uh, and our acquisition rates. And, and once again, if other people are doing consumer or not doing consumer, great. So to some extent, it's a great thing to increase the gospel of having flexible fitness. You know, at the other, we're not going that direction. We don't see the need to go there. Uh, others clearly see the need from their own unit economics to come to our space and great, you know, good for them. There's, there's a, you know, I tell our team this, right, which is there's a spectrum of employers out there. There's a very particular type of employer and health plan that say yes to us. Now, the ones that say no to us are always going to say no. Whether they say no and do nothing or whether they say no and do one of these subsidy models that are out there, great. They were never going to say yes to us. So it doesn't impact our world in any way. Right. When you And when you say it that way, and it, I don't think I've ever definitely not articulated it this way, but even thought it in my own head as you were saying that, it's almost as though the direct-to-consumer side is more of a and this is certainly bearing out, out as you look at the the performance over time and like you said, unit economics, maybe entertainment, maybe experience. You know, I want to try something new. I'm probably going to the gym anyway or I'm going to get this pass to try a couple different gyms to see what I like, but eventually I'm going to churn out. Whereas on your side and with the the kind of employer and insurance approach, it's it's really a health outcome approach. You were talking about 
focusing on engagement and increasing engagement exponentially over the course of this year. And, and really, if you're not producing results for individuals, for employers, for healthcare, you know, they're not going to keep you on and continue to pay for it. So it's, it's a little bit more, you know, outcome based than it would be just purely entertainment or, or sampling. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think they think of it as like a trial pack until they find the thing that they love, right? It's on the consumer side. And Jim Phillip, one of our board members had always told me, hey, that's great. You guys are really good at closing contracts. If you don't show engagement at scale, you'll close one contract and never the second. So that that's always been something on the top of our mind. And then monitoring the type of people we're engaging. And I think that's something we're most proud of at PeerFit is, you know, you just talked about health outcomes is, we're helping people be active that wouldn't normally be active, or we're helping them be active consistently, and they would never normally be consistently active. It's a completely different group than that direct-to-consumer person who, who buys a, a Groupon or you know uses ClassPass. Right? Those two have a person who's probably already very active, and they're, they're looking for something. We are focused on that group that needs help. They need the support. And if we can be there to build an ecosystem, a community uh, around them, then I think we're all winners in that scenario. And that's, you know, that approach is something that a lot of people don't know about us, which is, so we've been great plan partners with these health plans. And so they essentially begged us over the last year to come into the Medicare space, right? The senior citizen space where you really need to build a community around these, you know, that this population of, you know, how do we help them be active every day? How do we give them something to do? And how do we fight loneliness and isolation, which is becoming a problem for that group, just on top of the benefits of getting somebody physically active. And so we launched into this space uh, this year. We've got multiple health plans already, multiple states, uh, oh, you know, 100,000 plus uh, members. It's It's really remarkable to see how it took us many years to achieve that milestone, right? To get a health plan and to cross the 100,000 uh, lives threshold. It took us many years to do that in under 65 because we were building the company and building their credibility. And now, you know, we spun up this uh, division inside of PeerFit a little over a year and a half ago. And within a year and a half, right? Closed more health plans, already working on 2021 uh, that we, we call the the product peer fit move. I don't know why everyone in the senior market <laughs> could create silver this and silver right, that. Yeah. Uh, sil silver products are for old people. That's what someone in our uh, focus group told us. I don't use silver X because it's for old people. And she was in her seventies. And so, you know, peer fit move, that's what we call ours is all about getting you moving, being part of a movement, getting together, uh, whether it's in the gym or we do community events or people can go, you know, do walking groups in the park and stuff like that. So at, at our essence, you know, it goes back to focus. We've always been focused on how do you redefine wellness, do it through the health plans. And we went from doing it through the health plans on under 65 and now doing that, you know, same mission through health plans on the over 65 side. So we're really happy with the decisions we're making. Like I said, the, the market is, is changing. It, do you go consumer? Do you go employer? Do you do subsidy? Do you fully funded? We've always done the same thing. And because of that, have been able to become experts at what we do. Right. And it's playing out. Like you said, there's, you know, folks kind of looking over your shoulder and, and, and that's, uh, what do they say? Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. And, um, you know, you have to just keep it, keep it going and, and continue to innovate, which is incredible to see. Um, speaking of the kind of the markets shifting and things changing and, and everything, especially whether that's wellness or fitness or even, the health insurance and certainly the, the workforce. Um, how are you thinking about some of the changes that are in the, the atmosphere, whether that's, you know, the emergence of streaming and connected fitness. So that's changing the fitness landscape. And as I'm saying this, I realize it's a little bit of a loaded question. So you have <laughs> that, that, that piece changing, you have potentially changes coming to the private health insurance, um, that, would certainly come into play. And then there's also the, the workforce, you know, about this firsthand, the, the move to toward remote workers. Um, and, and while that might not affect peer fit, the, the number of freelancers. Um, so those changes, whether it's in fitness, whether it's in, in health insurance, whether it's in the workforce, a CEO, how are these things kind of percolating in your mind and, and how are you approaching them? 
That's a fantastic question. Look, I know that you love to be out in front of everything. So what I'm going to do is I'll go ahead and give you my bold predictions for 2020. How about that on on our market? And then you can be the first to have them here. So, uh, and, and I think there's a lot of players around the edges as you just articulated, right? It isn't just about flexible fitness. There's so many players that, that touch our industry and can be equally affected and have downstream implications. So, you know, I think one of the first ones is, you know, for full disclosure, a company who invested in you all recently, right? The, the mind bodies of the world, um, what they're shifting towards, right? You've got, on one hand, you've got them, and now that they're under Vista, how do they how do they consolidate to become the center place of wellness? How do they go after the consumer more? And I think that's going to be an interesting analysis of what does them being more consumer centric mean for the rest of the marketplace? I think you're going to start to see their path bear out, which will make a lot of other people shift. Right? You've got exponential which has openly talked about them doing a multi-studio pass. And, you know, they went from the holder of the brands to now there could be a direct-to-consumer flexible, you know, fitness pass uh, competitor for for some of those in the direct-to-consumer space, right? And how much power do they wield? And what does that mean for mind-body versus exponential? I think that's going to be something that you're going to see play out starting in 2020 and really 2021 is where you'll actually see rubber to road. You'll probably just see the paths being laid down. So there's my first prediction is so many people are dependent on those two brands uh, in terms of supply, whether it's the, the platform side of, of mind body or whether it's the physical brand supply that Exponential has and whatever they choose to do, people are going to have to move off of it, right? Uh, Streaming is going to be a really interesting one because I was just reading an article this morning uh, Back to New York here. Forte is here in New York, mm-hmm. and um, you know she posted an article this morning talking about well, streaming's not a trend; it's a fad, right? It's a seasonal thing, and I'm not so sure I agree with that. I- I'm watching firsthand people who didn't engage in fitness regularly do it now from their home. I I am not convinced that this is going anywhere but up. Mm -hmm. I I think that it's going to become a mainstay. But what I don't think is I don't think it's going to displace the need for people to still see each other. Now, when you get into a a complete VR style thing that maybe I'm looking around and it looks like I can see everybody else, maybe, and I can talk to them, that could be something that could be displacing to the everyday gym and studio. Uh, And and you're starting to see that happen. 2020, once again, you're going to see a lot of VR integrations. And the more that we move to 5G and faster internet speeds, ooh, it's just going to make it so much easier for people to consume fitness from their home in what feels like a lifelike environment. Right. And as long as you can do it where you can bridge the social connections, then absolutely. And last, look, I think you're going to see some pretty interesting acquisitions, mergers, and integrations, a lot of consolidation over the next 18 months. And I think the people that do the smartest job of stabilizing a path towards profitability and growth, right? Sustainability during those acquisitions will, you're going to, I think you'll see that happen in 2020, will be the winners of this whole game that we're playing, right? If we're playing a game of Thrones and our industry I think you're going to start to see the winners emerge and what the future of flexible fitness and health dollars, consumer dollars, you know, the fight to fund and control the consumer's wallet in wellness and fitness. I think you're going to start to see the winners bear out in 2020. Interesting. A lot, a lot to kind of take in there. Um, And I think frankly, a lot of things that, that I agree with and, and trying to, you know, stay on top of as well. In fact, um, you know, this week in the Fit Insider newsletter, what we sent out was really a look at what the so-called gym apocalypse really means, and and a lot yes. of that has to do with listen, people are, yeah, that streaming or connected fitness on demand VR whatever it is, that's just going to continue to impact the workout. It's not going to completely isolate people from the need to socialize. And if people are socializing and seeking out human interaction, there's a component of wellness that comes with that. And it's just going to shift what that interaction looks like. Um, 
So kind of couldn't agree more with that point. Um, and one of the things I wanted to touch on as well, and this goes to the point of the kind of shifting workforce, that PeerFit is a fully remote team. Um, that that was obviously a decision that you made in terms of the company culture and how you wanted to, to grow the company. Um, can you just talk about what you know made you want to do that, how you're able to achieve the what seems like everybody that, I either see on social media or have interacted with at PeerFit absolutely loves it um, and is crazy passionate about the culture. So how did you make this decision to be a fully remote team and and how are you able to create such strong company culture even though you all aren't together in an office? Yeah. Hey, you know, we're doing it right now. The the interaction of video and stable Wi-Fi helps, uh, helps certainly a lot. So look, I, I think there's a kind of interesting question, which is, why do you have to be in person to, and I know we just talked about doing VR and, right. and streaming at home, but it's like, why do you have to be in person all the time to be productive? You don't, right? Uh, there are now great systems like Slack and Trello, and we use the whole Google Enterprise side so that everything that we do is instantly notifying everything else that we do. I know every project people are working on. I can give real-time input you know, even when I'm at a conference and nobody misses a beat, right? That's the world we live in. And I, I think that you want to be as efficient as possible in this competitive world, which is I want people to work for PeerFit because they want to be here and not because they were the best talent in a city I was hiring for. Because let's say I found the best candidate in the world and she lives in Detroit and headquarters is in Tampa. Well, is she going to make her kids get out of school and move? And yeah, you know, it's just very taxing on people. So we said, well, what if we can build a system that it allows people the freedom to communicate? We can be delivered, never take communication for granted, right? You're not going to bump into anybody at the water cooler. So can we set up channels in Slack where people can just literally talk about nothing work related? We have a whole channel about watching and people share what they're watching on Netflix or Disney Plus or, you know, things like that. We've got a channel, PeerFit Pets, which is probably the most beloved channel we have. Amazing. People share pictures of their dogs and cats. And, you know, it, it's, it's people spend more time on PeerFit Pets than anything. But, like, these are the things that you're doing. You're taking the in-person experience of being in an office and say, how can I replicate those uh, and scale those? And I just, you know, we, we, I talked to somebody in an insurance company once who said, I hate days that I have to come to the office. I have this protocol when I'm in the office. I have this protocol when I'm remote. And, you know, that's terrible. So we all have the same protocol, whether we're physically working together, whether, you know, we have an all hands and everybody comes into Tampa on that day, you're still getting to work off of the exact same protocol. And we've been very fortunate. We won, you know, Entrepreneur Magazine, top 10 company cultures. Comparably, we won a bunch of, you know, top culture awards. I think, you know, our team is obsessed with helping people. I don't believe in bringing up problems unless you're ready to talk about solutions. So we have a very, you know, action-oriented, problem-solving, we got your back type community. Uh, and because I'm obsessed, I probably post, you know, more and communicate more than, than anyone else in the whole company. Some, some days they know that I'm a hundred percent all in, I'm a hundred percent dedicated. And, you know, I think it's really easy. If it starts up the top that way, then there's no excuse that down the line, uh, it's not going to penetrate through because they know I'll roll up my sleeves and jump on any project that they need. I'll make phone calls and help out. And, you know, any day that, that we need to move something fast or get something done, and I think when you have that type of uh, a culture, you know, you could now take me out of the equation and it will continue to perpetually exist, you know, even without me around. So, uh, and, and frankly, I always tell this and it's a bit tongue in cheek, but I 100% agree it. It's really difficult to gossip and complain in a remote culture mm. because I'd have to purposefully put an effort to call you up or to message you to do that when generally... A lot of that stuff happens in office because you're just trying to fill blank space. You're trying to fill silence in an elevator. Like, oh man, that person really, you know, right? Like, you don't have any of that. So I think it's just naturally a more positive culture that we've instilled. And 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 this is a competitive advantage that when we talk to employers and we say, if you're thinking about doing wellness this year, right, we show everything that we've won, all the awards because culture is so important to us, and say, if we didn't have a great culture, how could we help you build a great culture? And because we're great at it. 
we're going to help you be great at it too. Yeah, it's it's something to be incredibly proud of. I, I again, I think it's something that's you know I didn't know about all the awards and, and the the different achievements from you know that external recognition. But like I said, it's just it's obvious. It's obvious from the things that that you put on social media. It's obvious from the things that your team um, posts and talks about. And and so it, it must be something you're incredibly proud of. And certainly, it sounds like it is. Um, how does you know where you are today in terms of you know, some of the other, whether you look at them as just milestones and benchmarks that um, might be more like scoreboard type things that people can point to, the amount of people you've helped, the the growth in the company, the f- amount of money you've raised to this point, uh, all those things that are fantastic, as well as helping people get healthy, building an amazing culture. What does you know, looking back, the vision and the idea and when you started PeerFit, um, what does that look like in comparison to where you are today? Is is this what you imagined? Was this the intention all along? Or, you know, has it been a series of reevaluating and changing and bigger and bigger goals? Like how did how does that initial vision differ from where the company is today? So this is a, I have, uh, you know, this is a bit of a yes and no, right? Where we all, Ultimately, knew we wanted to drive to the place where um, we were helping people try new classes and that they could use employer or healthcare dollars. But we thought that would just be like a piece that that we would do a lot of other things along the way. And now it's like at our core, we knew it was important. We just didn't think that it would be the thing from an order of operations we'd go to first. And I remember our early days, that early founding team. You know, like Scott and I used to talk about. Oh, we've got to get employers' dollars. We've got to get you know the healthcare dollars, but that'll just be a nice to have. That won't be a must to have kind of a thing, you know. Or man, it'd be great if your grandmother could put money into your PeerFit wallet, right? We always knew there'd be like this central piggy bank that people and entities would be putting money into, uh, and we knew this would be a piece of it. But now it is; it's the piece of it, and. You know, it, there are some days where we completely pivot and change and think of ideas that we'd not thought of before, ever thought were pre, you know, previously available. Look, and and to be frank, there's also days where we're sitting here saying, "Gosh, this took us 15 months, mm-hmm. and we thought it was going to take us three months." You know, who would have known this this was going to take this much time to do? So, you know, we, when everybody does a look back, they always think about the positives. I think like, "Oh man, you know." Uh, a year ago, we were this and now we're this. And, you know, just from a numbers perspective, this is how I like to measure this. I've said this publicly a couple times. So in, I don't, I don't ever count January in terms of our acquisition of new lives, right? simply because so many of them happen in January. And it's not because of the reason you're thinking, which is, you know, fitness, New Year's resolution. It's because most health plans renew on January 1st. So that's when we get a whole bunch of new members, right? So I look at everything else. I try to look at February to June as a good indicator of organic growth, right? In, in 2017, we were adding uh, about 110 new lives a month, paid lives a month, right? In 2018, we were adding about 1,000 new lives a month. This year, we were adding 10,000 new lives a month. So when you just think about like that rate of customer acquisition through our leverage channel partners, it's been remarkable. And then to say, you know, we've increased our denominator significantly this year in terms of new lives, yet, as I mentioned, net increased engagement per life by 61% this year. So both quantity and quality have exponentially you know, grown this year. And it's because of all of those years of effort, dedication, and frankly, investment in people, ideas, culture, and great partners uh, that got us to this point. And look, I hope you and I can sit down and talk at this time next year. I hope we look back at 2019 and be like, can you believe we were only doing 10,000 new lives a month, right? That's, you know, that's where I hope that we get to next year and the year after is, you know, this year, we really had just a small handful of channel partners that were baking this in, and we've already closed and we'll be announcing a lot of new health plan partners for 2020 and 2021. So just even the raw number of partners will be dramatically increasing, let alone our ability to penetrate those lives deeper and deeper and increase utilization between every single life. That's how we're measuring success. 
Yeah, and that, that look back, we'll definitely have to get some time on the calendar to circle back the end of next year and, and do a little uh, post game. Um, well, look, I'm in Pittsburgh all the time, and you know we call it peer fit to beer fit. We'll go work out and do happy hour. There listen, you go. We'll show you around. We know all the spots. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem. And and kind of with that, after that, you know, kind of looking back, now we'll get you out of here on this one. I know we've we've talked about a ton, and I'm sure there are ambitious goals and a, a ton of things that you're focused on that you could name, but. Um, just as we we get to the end of the year and start to think about 2020, what are you what are you most excited about at PeerFit right now, and, and what are kind of kind of some of the things that are on the horizon that we could be on the lookout for? Or maybe you can't tell us because it's top secret. Sure, no, no, I'll tell you. Well, there's I'd say there's a, a couple, and I'll and I'll you know part A and B here, which is Move has been such a labor of love for us in the last year. Core has been, it's a much more mature product, right? We've been doing it for years. We've been driving engagement. And so Move consumed a lot of our attention this year, just because we had to build it from the ground up, go and get those first contracts, right? But it didn't make Core any less valuable. So I am so happy to have Move and Core both operating now for 2020. I mean, it's literally like being a CEO of two different businesses. We, you know, we do have overlapping staff in some extent, and then we also have some that are only on core and only on move. So really taking it from, we kind of had to keep move separated and siloed to protect it, to build it, to now blending the cultures of both the product, the staff, our, our, you know, our strategies, the communities that we're building. So uh, it, it hopefully, fingers crossed, will feel really good and satisfying to the whole company, no matter which side of the house they're on, core or move, to see see us once again kind of looking back like wow here we are nationwide helping seniors through medicare advantage plans helping under 65 through their employers through their health plans uh, and that's just i think kind of a magical uh community that we're building is that we're able to do that and so that's a big big just simply kicking that off uh, is just you know we're, there's still a lot of work to be done um and we're excited about that. So move is, is undoubtedly you know something. And then everything else really that we're focused on is engagement. What are the levers of engagement that we can drive? Is it you know networks in some areas and certain brand partner partnerships? Is it certain features inside of the platform? Is it certain ways that we're recommending through you know AI and machine learning? Is it certain peer to peer notifications that we're doing? So all of those are on the horizon. So uh, needless to say. 2020 from the user experience. So for all of you who are listening that have beer fit, right, it's going to be really exciting as a user. We're going to do some really cool things. You know, we look at apps that have nothing to do with fitness, like the, the Starbucks app, and just how amazingly sticky it is by doing streets and so on. So how can we replicate great things like that inside of our experience? And then lastly, I'll give you a, a KPI, right? So that you can know that. I mean, what we're working on right now is all of our contracts are almost done a year in advance. So by mid-year, we'll pretty much know what we have for 2021. You know, can we get to approximately, not exactly, can we get to a million lives for pure fit move for 2021, right? And, and, and all that comes down to how successful is the platform, our engagement, our ability to get in front of people. And can we grow core equally as fast during that time, right? Can we get to 2021 and say, We've got a million lives on core and we've got a million lives on move. Man, we'd be we'd be really happy if that's how 2020 goes. Amazing. Ambitious goals. And certainly you have me fired up, ready to run through a wall. <laughs> Just talking the energy you have and talking about it and, and looking forward to the new year. Um, so definitely excited to continue to watch you guys' success as you, you continue to move through the industry and really redefine what corporate wellness is and how people are getting and staying active. It's, it's awesome to watch. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. And you know, like I said, we're, we're just happy to be helping people and be a part of you know, the broader solutions. Awesome. Exciting stuff. And, and thanks for making time today, Ed. Absolutely. Thank you.